Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be back here at the Bitcoin Expo. Uh, you know, a lot has changed from when we did the research study. I don't know if Dan and uh, Jeremy, they're probably somewhere in the room or around the conference. Uh, when, they, when they raised half a million dollars to give many of you uh, your initial hundred dollars in Bitcoin, uh, that graph just shows the increasing interest in this space, I think, and it's exploded uh, around the end of 2017. Um, if you're wondering, you know, what happened to that alpha million dollar that uh, Jeremy and Dan had raised and we distributed and studied uh, in 2014, well, the answer is never underestimate uh, MIT undergrads. Uh, one of the things people were keeping asking uh, was, like, why aren't people spending it? And, and it turns out that, you know, the, the 30x return was a pretty wise choice. Um, it also got the, the research results in, in science uh, on the cover of it. We got Bitcoin next to emerging infectious diseases, which I thought was pretty appropriate. Uh, so, you know, for, from uh, 2014, I think a lot has changed. There's many competing standards. Uh, I think we're seeing a lot of interesting implementations around layer two solutions. And many have claimed that we're headed towards some sort of dot coin bubble. Uh, a lot of hype and enthusiasm. I think that was covered also this morning. Um, and the reason is simple. The reason is that the cost of experimenting in this space, which I think is good news, is very low. We're talking about 75 lines of code, right? To launch your token uh, on top of Ethereum, maybe it's less by today. Uh, but that's something that, you know, economists have something to say about. It's something that we've studied in the past. And uh, I think the more surprising graph to, to many people has been really the rise of initial coin offerings, uh, outpacing venture capital activity in this space, uh, spreading experiments not just in the U.S., but really around the globe. Now, the challenge is that I think the narrative has, has been really focused on uh, a tulip mania. And it turns out that even if you go back to the historical records, uh, Anne Godgar uh, did actually some real research on, on the tulip mania, it turns out that a lot of that uh, wasn't actually true, and we're basing today's accounts on the satirical accounts of, of the Dutch writers. Um, and, and I think we're, we're caught in a, in a similar problem right now, where it's hard to distinguish, distinguish facts uh, from fiction. Um, you know, from an economics uh, perspective, I think this is a technology that's having a large impact on, on two major costs that society faces. Uh, we call them cost of verification, cost of networking, for the lack of time, uh, I'm going to focus kind of on the second one, uh, which really explain why you're seeing so many projects, you're seeing so many different interpretations of what you can do with this technology. Um, long story short, I think people have been super focused on funding and using tokens as a way to raise capital. I think that's kind of missing the point. You're trying to build a digital ecosystem, I think as some have already mentioned through the morning, and so a token is a quite powerful mechanism for uh, building a relationship with early adopters, building a relationship with developers, building on top of your protocol, uh, building a relationship with investors no matter where they're located. And I think over time, as the market becomes more safe and, and improves, I think you'll see a lot of really interesting applications. You know, you can use it to crowdsource resources around the globe the same way, you know, when, when Satoshi released the white paper, uh, and, and everything else around Bitcoin, we essentially deployed for the first time in history a massive network that can secure uh, financial-like transactions on a global scale without assigning anyone market power. I think this whole concept of writing code and deploying infrastructure is going to go much broader. You can think about storage, you can think about a number of other industries, but essentially it's writing code that, that builds networks, and, and that's where really something fundamental is changing in the economy. You can also use that same code to attract top talent. So think about our open source as, as, as kind of rallied resources around pro-social incentives, about job market signaling, and other reasons for kind of bringing people within your ecosystem. Here, you can pay for those people too. You can use that token to reward talent no matter where it's coming from. And, and that's quite powerful from, a, from an economics and, and market design perspective. You can use those tokens. These are the results from our, our paper in science to incentivize early adopters. It turns out that when you try to explain why do certain technologies diffuse and others don't, part of it is often what role do early adopters play in their diffusion. In our own study, there was a 45% difference in adoption speed and use based if you did the seeding of the technology optimally versus not. So there's a lot at stake in the, in the token ecosystem. Um, 
to try to you know, separate some of the hype from, from the substance, one of the first things we did was develop a theoretical model. So this is heavy on the math and, and economic side, but the basic idea is to strip tokens of every functionality, forget voting, dividends, all, all the fancy things you can do with them, and just try to ask why would they ever add value? And we benchmark them against venture capital, which is something that I think a lot of entrepreneurs are familiar with, and we come up with the answer that in marketplaces where you're worried about network effects, which is pretty much any digital platform that you use today, tokens are a quite revolutionary concept. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, you, you've heard this morning joy, and I think some of the narrative has been around all of these tokens are fraud, right? 99% of the tokens that you see out there, out there today are frauds and scams. Uh, and, and my worry when I read that narrative is that I think we're making the same mistake of thinking about tulips basing our accounts on the satirical accounts of the time. So our goal at the Crypto Economics Lab was to bring data, to bring facts, and, and to really observe what's going on in this marketplace. Is the marketplace rational? Are we seeing any interesting sign of something bubbling uh, that could be quite worthwhile? Uh, and so what we did, uh, which is kind of where our strengths are, we collected a massive amount of data. And I don't know if Galen is here from Token Report. Uh, shout out to Galen for you know, providing us additional data that they've been curating. Shout out to CoinList for providing us information on, on investors. But then a shout out to all the RAs and, uh, and my co-authors, uh, because we did an extensive manual search going back to, to Web Archive, you know, collecting all the GitHubs, Twitter feeds, historical domain registration data, conversation in Bitcoin Talk, everything you can imagine that's out there, we collected, uh, together with a database of about 8,000 individuals scattered across the globe that are involved with this. Uh, so it's, it's a large population of innovators, entrepreneurs, and maybe excited, over-optimistic individuals. Uh, we linked it to the traditional sources, also to relate it to venture capital and angel finance, and uh, the web of science. One of the ideas was like, can we find academic publications in, crypt in cryptography, math, uh, that kind of you know, are part of the background of these individuals. So we wanted to see how much of academic science is starting to pour into this space. And then we got all the transaction data, essentially prices, and, and everything else you would imagine. Now, let me show you some numbers. Um, I'll go fairly quickly. I, I think I have like 50 slides in 20 minutes, so uh, be ready for, for a quick ride. Uh, this is the graph that I think everybody's familiar with. Big explosion in December. Uh, even for people like me that have been doing research in this since 2013, it's really difficult to imagine how much this has accelerated in the last six months. And you know, it doesn't just accelerate it within all of you, but it is also accelerated with regulators. Uh, there's no regulator that is not really looking at this and, and trying to figure out what to do. Um, first of all, you know, a number of these campaigns fail. Uh, I think in, in, in the current set that you're seeing today, more than 600 successfully raised capital. Uh, they're not successful yet. They just successfully closed their campaign. And you can see that the data is gonna pretty much double uh, within probably the next 30 to 60 days. Um, this is slightly outdated. I think in our last snapshot, there's about $8 billion that have been moved. And I want you to just pause for a second. Now, a lot of that is going to be hype, speculation. You know, there's a good degree of fraud going on, uh, as we'll see in the data. But this is a mechanism that can move $8 billion within months. Okay? I've studied crowdfunding for, for 10 years, and Kickstarter has done half of that in, in about 10 years. So this is just the speed uh, of how this is all moving. Now, first misconception. One out of four of these tokens doesn't raise any money. So I think you're hearing in the press all the crazy examples. And by the way, when Kickstarter was starting, I think the narrative was the same. Some of you may remember the headline, 75% of Kickstarter projects don't deliver on time or don't deliver at all. Uh, of course, Kickstarter developed in a very healthy platform over time. But one out of four of these tokens raises no money. So there's a long tail. This is, you know, always in digital marketplaces, you always see this on Amazon, on you know, pick your, pick your you know, digital platform of choice. It's extremely skewed. It's a blockbuster economy. Now, the other number that I'd like you to focus on is the average of that curve, which almost looks like a bell curve. It's one to five million. So this looks like a C to Series A level investment in the US. It's definitely a venture capital round outside of the US. And so we're moving not just a lot of capital, but you're moving rounds that are meaningful. 
Where did most of the money go? Well, it turns out that most of the money went to the largest teams. This is, again, a feature of blockbuster markets. So when you're thinking about, sure, there's a number of ICOs, there's a long tail of really crazy projects, but most of the capital is really locked into the largest teams, um, as you can see here on the graph. Uh, what are people doing? Turns out that I think from 2016, we went a step back, and we realized, well, if we want to rebuild a decentralized internet, well, first we need to rebuild the infrastructure. So a lot of these projects are really at the infrastructure building stage. A lot of this is, is designed to support and really push the space forward, re rethinking you know, the internet from, from the ground up. So I see that as fairly positive. Now for some of the bad news. Uh, some of these themes, and, and a lot of this is excitement, you know, opportunistic entry, uh, and let's call it that way. Some of these themes are assembled really quickly. This is one of our favorite measures that I'm sure, you know, once the paper is out, people will try to game. But it turns out that, you know, we can see when did you register your domain and when did you launch. And about 30% in 2016 didn't have a domain name 60 days before the ICO. Okay? So I want you to think about that. Now, of course, maybe they launched a separate one to make sure that investors wouldn't go on the wrong link or whatever. Uh, but that's just, you know, one of the signs. Now, the good gift, I think, that we got from Bitcoin is white papers. I, I think the, you know, the Satoshi white paper was this example of a hybrid between almost like a pure academic paper and something that had a vision about what, what, what are we here to build. And luckily, that template uh, ported over. And so we can use that. That's information that we can extract. So we can throw a lot of machine learning. Shout out to Kevin Zhang, uh, who is my co-author on this, uh, to, to do some clever things. I'll show you some of the basic stuff, but one of the main changes has been that white papers have shifted from being heavy on tech to being very polished, okay? Uh, and now polished can be two things. It could be a good team with good tech and a good graphic designer, or it could be someone is trying to sell you something, uh, like a prospectus. Age distribution, and this is, I think, when policymakers look at this space and you know they're claiming, do we want the next Silicon Valley to be here or elsewhere? Look how young. Okay, this is the next generation of talent. They're extremely young. I mean, I, I look like really old on that, on that graph, right? Um, the, the other thing that uh, I think it's, it's, I didn't expect going in, uh, I think crypto economics right now is this weird space where there's not a lot of good crypto, there's not a lot of good economics. We're try, trying to change that together. Uh, but one thing that these founders have in common is that often they have one individual or more that have both a computer science background and a finance, economics, uh, you know, slash business background. And I would have assumed that it was two different people on the same team. Turns out that often these are hybrid individuals. So this is kind of quite novel, I think, in this space. Uh, one of the claims is like, look, the code base is open source. You can go and look at the GitHub. You can evaluate the venture yourself. Well, it turns out that in all of these markets, think about even Kickstarter or AngelList, all these crowdsourced markets, if you don't have incentives for doing due diligence yourself, nobody's going to do it. Um, so what we see is that, sure, the GitHub sometimes is out there. There's some code base. But how much do people actually use it? Uh, just to give you one of the graphs, to give you a sense of the skew, this is the contributors to the different GitHubs for our full sample of 1,500 ICOs, and most of the mass is at zero. There's literally five people, right? Then, of course, you have the very developed communities with a lot of people engaged, uh, but it's extremely skewed. So when we're talking about ICO, one of the things to keep in mind is that it's not all the same, okay? Uh, so how does this relate to traditional sources of capital? Think about venture capital and VC. I'm going to go really quickly. Um, here's a map of where the capital went. I guess good news, most of it went to the US. Uh, so Silicon Valley is definitely not dead. Um, <clears throat> investors are everywhere. Okay, This is KYC data, so we know exactly where these investors are. And it's pretty much everywhere around the globe. Now, if you're curious about the US, let's go a bit more in detail. On the accredited investor market, you see the classic two sides on the east and the west coast. Uh, I, it's very much where you think entrepreneur activity would be concentrated. Uh, let's benchmark them on a line. So here, any country above that red line received more funding through ICOs uh, than funding through Series A venture capital. Okay, I'm going to pause you for a few seconds. Pick your country of choice. Even the United States, it's pretty close to the diagonal. Now, of course, a lot of that may be driven by the fact that, well, 2017 and especially the last part was hype, enthusiasm, and overinvestment. 
But this shows that capital can flow to regions that don't have the same venture capital and angel ecosystem as the US. And even if you go down one level by state, look at California. California is above the diagonal. So that's the canary in the coal mine for you. If there's one region that we're all counting on, on, on moving this forward, uh, it's probably California. Now, let's go to the, to the fun part. And that's Ponzi, by the way. Uh, <laughs> can you separate opportunistic entry, I'm going to call it opportunistic entry, uh, from the I potential projects? Because that's the social welfare question. If you're, if you're in government and you're trying to think about this, you don't want to kill the entire space, but you want to make sure the fraud and scam stay at bay. I removed the regressions because I don't have a lot of time, so I'll show you figures, there'll be pictures uh, to, to tell you what we have in the regression, but I promise you there's lots of regressions and data analysis. Okay. <clears throat> so, where's the Crypto Valley? Well, first of all, did places like Singapore and Switzerland attract more frauds and scams? The answer is no. So whatever they're doing to be proactive and, and, and welcoming is not attracting the wrong guys, so it's not a market for lemons. Also, you know, if you're trying to defraud someone, you're going to do something that looks a lot like everything else. Most frauds are within the cryptocurrency vertical. You're trying to do something pretty vanilla. The more technical and advanced white papers are way less likely to be frauds and scam. Okay? <clears throat> Plagiarism, like in school, is a bad thing. Right? So if you're plagiarizing your white paper, it's very much likely to be a fraud or scam. If you have a stronger code base, think about your GitHub, the developers engage, you know. You do really basic stuff with, with the machine learning. What's the quality of the code base? Better code bases, way less likely to be frauds and scam. Is the community able to figure this out? Is there any consensus forming? It turns out that conversations by bots and marketers is, is more likely to be fraud and scam. Okay? So if you're trying to do a pump and dump, you're probably hiring a bunch of bots and running a bunch of marketing. Conversation by experts, not so much. The experts are, are way less correlated with anything that's a fraud or scam. Part two, is the market completely irrational, right? Is, is this a tulip bubble? Are they spraying money at random, as people have been saying? Well, the answer to that is actually no. Uh, and also that Silicon Valley is far from over, okay? A lot of the narrative has been about, okay, the money's flowing elsewhere. That's true. So places like Switzerland are attracting a disproportionate amount of funding relative to, to their entrepreneurial ecosystem, but Silicon Valley is by far the leader. So think about 8 billion, more than 2 went to the US, and then the next one is Switzerland with 1 billion. More technical white papers, more polished white papers, and white papers that don't do plagiarism are way more likely to attract more funding. Okay? So the market is not, is not completely rational. Same with good practices. If you have vesting, if you're trying to do things properly, you're way more likely to get funded if you're using you know, some of the more uh, pump and dumpy uh, approaches to this, you're, you're going to bring home way less money. The more engaged your code base, and a lot of this is obvious, right? So higher quality teams are getting more money. But it's good to see it in the data because it means the market is not completely irrational. So money is flowing to technical teams with strong code bases. If you've hired a bunch of bots and you know, flooded Bitcoin forum with your messages, you're going to bring home way less money. So the bots are not working. So for those of you that are trying, stop. The experts on the other side, so people that are influential and get quoted a lot, get a lot of engagement, they're driving the money. And a lot of this could be a self-fulfilling prophecy, but you're seeing that it's, it's working in, in the right way. In the very few last seconds, let me tell you a little bit about early performance. Now, of course, it's too early to say because the markets are completely rational and you can pick your token of choice that's worth over billions and, and probably doesn't have a lot of substance behind it. Uh, how many of these are underwater? So the current price, less than the minimum price at the ICO, turns out it's been increasing. Okay? Um, it was about 20% and now it's like somewhere between 40 and 50%. Uh, again, it's early to tell. Teams that have hired bots and we're trying to manipulate things, of course, are performing poorly on these marketplaces. So the market is rewarding the teams that were picked up by the experts. Again, it's not completely irrational. ICOs with the strongest technical team with deep computer science expertise, and often it doesn't need a PhD, but it needs just that experience, are the ones that are performing well. And many are, are not even traded. Right? So they're deciding uh, to just not be traded yet. So what we do is we look at how fast are they advancing on the code base. Are we going towards multiple 
crypto valleys. I think places again like Switzerland and Singapore that have been open to this space are doing extremely well. They haven't attracted the lemons. They have attracted teams that are doing quite good. And so I want to leave you with this final slide with three key points. The first one is that from an economics perspective, we're witnessing a new technology that fundamentally changes market power in digital platforms. It's quite exciting you know, to economists like me to think about the digital platforms we have today and what the ones of the future, the more decentralized ones, may look like. Removing that market power and lowering barriers to innovation and barriers to competition. As in any other period, think about the dot-com, when there's uncertainty and we're trying to learn about the future, we don't know where the opportunities are, opportunistic entry, frauds and scams, and over-optimistic teams. Just go back to you know, the, the pets.co or the whatstartup.gov, which is a great documentary around the dot-com. That always happens. Railways, any major technological breakthrough add the same dynamics. And so it's important to think about market protection, uh, you know, going after the frauds and scammers, isolating them, increasing disclosure standards, and so on. But what I would say is that, you know, relative to what you heard in the press, once you start looking at the data, the market is far from being completely irrational. So people, you know, some people may be defrauded, uh, but on average, what's being rewarded right now is good computer science and good computer science talent. Now, will they be able to execute? We don't know. But I think the bottom line is that no single region, no single country that wants to be ahead in this technology can afford to lose this space and to shut it down. Thank you very much.